Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for a very nice introduction. Thanks also for the great weather. This is really a lot of effort. I appreciate it. <laughs> and yeah, it's great to be here in person. The last time I was at CMU, actually, the only time was during at the beginning of the pandemic. It was all over Zoom. So it's very nice to see the people in real life as well. Um, cool. So um, today I want to tell you about sort of like my journey in the past. Is this going to work actually? Doesn't look like it's working. Okay, we'll just use this guy. Okay, cool. So, wait, this is also not working. Uh, can I move the slide? <laughs> so it was working. It was working. <laughs> yeah, so reliable machine learning, right? So the computers don't need to work at the beginning of our machine learning. But no, okay. So, uh, over the past 10 years, you've seen a really a lot of exciting progress in machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, and so on. And often, when we try to take these tools out of our lab environments, out of our standard benchmarks, and put them into the real world, it turns out that they don't quite work yet. They don't generalize reliably enough. This is something that has come up in self-driving cars, for instance. There was a lot of excitement around 2015. People are saying by 2020, we would have self-driving cars. I mean, we are getting there. There's slow but steady progress, but it turns out to be a really hard problem. And in other application areas like healthcare, robotics, online content moderation, since it's 2023, obviously also chatbot. In all of these cases, it turns out when you apply these systems in the real world, there are lots of problems that come up. And the big question that many people are thinking about, obviously also here at CMU, is how can we make machine learning more reliable? And this is something I've thought a lot about over the past, I guess, six years now. And I think at a high level, there's all two perspectives you can take. Um, one is we'll make our um, machine learning models more reliable by changing the training algorithms, the model architecture, the loss function, and so on. This is often what we do in machine learning research that we um, innovate on the modeling side, on the algorithmic side. And this, this is nice. There's been good progress that way. But I think there's a second piece to the puzzle that hasn't gotten as much attention yet, but is super promising from my perspective. And this is focusing on better training data. And so it's like what I want to do in this talk is of like explain where this perspective comes from and convince you that working on pre-training data sets is a really impactful way to make machine learning more reliable. And we are going to do this in three parts. First to all, for all of us to be on the same page. In the first part of the talk, we do a broad survey of robustness in computer vision. So we agree on what, what are the robustness challenges that um, we are studying. In the second part of the talk, we look at OpenAI's clip model because the clip model made a ton of progress on some really challenging um, distribution shift benchmarks from the first part. And then in the third part of the talk, we'll do a deep dive into CLIP to study where the robustness comes from. And the answer is going to be, it's all in the training data. So, but can you just drag that, that uh, little sharing? Thing yeah, this is a good idea. Um, okay. This is easier said than done. <laughs> I have no idea where my mouse point is, for instance, right now. Let's leave this for a second. Okay, go ahead. You want to drag it to your screen, actually? Okay. Like, you have to go up the top because it's easier. There you go. Okay. Smart, <laughs> smart. Okay, good. Next attempt. Also, I see the chat bubble here. Um, I'm not sure if I can monitor the chat during the talk. So, yeah, you know. exactly, exactly. So, do feel free to message in the chat. Well, now this is actually worse. Um, <laughs> uh, so, where does the, where did the Zoom thing go? Let's just close this slide chat. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. So, yeah, I also, I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. If you have any questions about the talk, don't wait until the end. Just interrupt me anytime and ask questions. Um, cool. Okay, so let's get started with the first part. And if you do this in the context of my favorite data set, which is still ImageNet, um, has been around for a long time, obviously. But there's just so much experimental infrastructure that we now have around ImageNet that it's a really good experimental test bed for comparing hypotheses around how we can make machine learning more reliable. And so like everyone knows the story, we have made really good progress on the in-distribution test set of ImageNet um, since the AlexNet result in 2012. And then as people started to deploy these models and realized that they are maybe not quite there yet in terms of um, robustness, people came up with a variety of out of distribution test sets. So the same 1000 classes, but um, the researchers introduced a distribution shift in the test set creation process. One of them I was involved in myself, the ImageNet V2 paper that I told you about a couple of years ago. 
Um, and there has been, have been many interesting papers along similar lines. The object net one from Josh Tenenbaum's group at MIT, of course here, um, image net sketch from CMU, and then also from Berkeley or so, around a similar time, image net R. And all of them sort of like explore different ways that um, image net models aren't as robust as we would like them to be. And this is obviously only one type of robustness. There's been a lot more work. So like for instance, adversarial robustness, again, you've done really amazing work here on that. Um, people have studied perturbations that occur naturally in videos, image corruptions like ImageNet C, data set shifts, we just talked about, um, geometric transformations like you can rotate or um, even 3D render an image, and so on. So, Nicolas Collini is still keeping track of all of the papers on adversarial robustness. And it's just a lot of them and quickly growing. And so, at the time when I was working on this around 2019, 2020, I found this increasingly confusing because there were so many different ways of testing robustness, and I wasn't sure how do they fit together, and are we making progress towards broadly robust models. And in order to figure this out, um, we did a big benchmarking study. So this was the last paper um, during my postdoc at UC Berkeley. And basically what we did there was just evaluate all the models we could find and all the distribution shifts we could find. So the main thing that we really produced is this 200 times 200 element matrix here. We on the x-axis, we have 200 different models that we ran. And then on the x-axis, we have 200 different distribution shifts that we used in order to evaluate the models. So every, every cell in this matrix here corresponds to evaluating one model on one test set. And just to give you a quick over... Yes, question? Oh, okay. Um, just to give you a quick overview on what's um, in this test set, let's first look at the y-axis, the 200 models. At a high level, we can categorize them into three different categories. The first one is what we call standard models. This is models that were built solely with the purpose of improving accuracy on ImageNet, like AlexNet, VGG, ResNet. There's been a ton of impactful work there. Um, the second category of model is what we call robust models. So these are models where the paper aims to improve some kind of distribution of robustness, adversarial robustness, and so on. And then the third kind of model is models trained on more data. So the first two categories only trained on ImageNet training set. The third one has extra training data. Okay, and then on the x-axis, the distribution shifts, again, we tried to plug in everything we could find, ImageNet v2, ObjectNet, ImageNet r, ImageNet sketch, we already mentioned, then there's ImageNet a, ImageNet with robust to test video robustness, adversarial attacks we obviously have in there, image corruptions, and so on. Cool, and there's a lot in this paper, I and mean, we're just going to look at one slice of this today, and before we look at the first set of results, I briefly want to clarify a little bit what do we mean by robustness? And we look at these accuracy numbers of a wide range of different models, right? And to illustrate this a little bit, let's look at this hypothetical example. Let's say we have two models, model A and model B. Model A gets 80% in distribution accuracy, model B gets 90%, and then out of distribution, um, 75 for model A, 77 for model B. Now the question is, which one is more robust, okay? If you just want to deploy the best model, the answer is clearly model B, because well, it has higher accuracy, that's what you should believe it. But from the perspective of um, robustness and distribution shift, um, another quantity that's very interesting is the accuracy drop. How much does a model suffer from the distribution shift here? And here, model A only has a 5% drop, model B has a 13 percentage point drop. So there's something about model A that makes it more robust. And the idea is, if we can figure out what it is about model A that makes it more robust, Hopefully we can combine this with the higher accuracy model B and then get the best of both worlds, like higher accuracy and smaller drop on the distribution shift. Cool. And now we're going to look at real data to see how things play out um, with real models and real um, data sets, test sets. And we are going to do this with the following kind of plot. Um, this plot is going to show up a lot, or this kind of plot is going to show up a lot on this talk. So we go to a step-by-step. -step. On the x-axis, we have uh, emission accuracy, just standard from one accuracy. On the y-axis, we'll put a distribution. So we started with ImageNet v2, and then every blue point here is one of the standard models in our test set. As I said, about 80 of them, going from the seminal AlexNet paper over VGG, ResNet, and so on, to the state of the art at the time when we got this paper, which was an official net v7. And then one thing that you can already see here, there's also a dashed line, y equals x. This will be no drop from distribution shift, but all of the models seem to like a 10 to 15% drop from distribution shift. Okay, cool. So one thing that's sort of noteworthy here is that all of these models follow a crisp linear trend. 
there's a good question why. We'll put this aside for now. We'll just take this as a given. Let's say the models just train on image and are always going to follow this red baseline here. This is useful because we can use this as a baseline for computing robustness. If you're given a new image model and then let's say 71% image net, um, then what I would expect based on the red line is about 58% out of the solution. Okay, and now the big question is, are there any models that get you above the red line? Because we know humans are above the red line. Humans are actually very close to y plus x. So we did this experiment with five expert human labels. They are on the y plus x line, and um, none of the models are. So if we want to lift our models up, improve them to get the human-like generalization capabilities here, we would like to move the red line up. And we're going to quantify this um, with a metric called effective robustness. This is just to lift up up this red baseline here. So the green star here is a hypothetical model that has non-trivial effective robustness. Cool. So this is sort of the setup here. And now the big question is, do any of the current robustness interventions achieve effective robustness? Any any questions so far? Yes. So for different distribution shifts, the gap is going to change a lot. I don't think that the distinguishing factor is natural or not. Like on the next slide, we're going to look at object net and it's a much larger group. Cool. But this is a good point. Thanks for bringing it up. Uh, question? Okay, then let's continue. And now I'm going to put all 200 models on the same plot. And this is what we get. And so maybe the first reaction is, this just looks like the same plot. Nothing really changed. And this is indeed the right takeaway here. So we have the brown points, which are robustness interventions, like adversarial training, special types of data augmentation, and so on. And then you also have the green points here, which are models trained on more data. And the brown points are basically all very close to the red line. The only models that stand out by a little bit, sort of like one to two percentage points, are models pre-trained on more data. On the top right is a model from Google and trained on 300 million data points. Then the Instagram model from Facebook trained on one billion um, images. And then a model trained on the large image net data set um, about 10 to 20 million images. And this gives you small um, but measurable amount of effective robustness. Cool. So this is all. Sorry, yeah. I'm just curious. Does, does this uh, picture replicate the top five accuracy? Yeah, exactly the same for top five. There's also a question in chat. Um, what about within model families? Are there families that show better slopes than others? For example, some some effect from aggregating across model families. Good question. So I don't have that in the slide deck. Um, we have a paper on this accuracy on the line phenomenon where we do similar kinds of experiments and all sorts of different model families share the same linear trend. Like on SIFAR 10, this is very pronounced. You can do logistic regression, Gaussian kernel SVM, random forest, random features, confnet, solution transformers, they're all on the same line. Cool. Okay. All good questions, but this is all in the context of just one data set so far, right? This is only image in V2, so we should look at more data sets to understand what's going on more broadly. So let's look at object net. This is the data set, as I mentioned, from Josh Tannebaum's group at MIT, and I had nothing to do with this data set, yet the plot still looks very similar, right? We have this nice clean baseline here. Most of the models are on the baseline. The drop is much larger now, right? So we just talked about this image net was only at 10%. For emission in V2 was only a 10 percentage point drop. Now we have about 40 percentage points, so much larger drop. Um, the only models that stand out above the red line are still the same more data models that stood out on emission in V2. V2. Um, cool. And we, we could go on through a lot more plots now. Um, for some of them, the picture is a little bit different. For instance, these are image net sketch and image net R. And one thing that you see here is that some of the brown data points, these are more. Uh, these are data, special data augmentation models. They stand out a little bit, but by far the best models are still the green points. Train, so models train on more data. Yeah. There's also this weird cloud of yellow points here. I've broken out the adversarial robust models. I don't know what's going on with this. So like, it's low accuracy, and it's not something you should be doing. Like, concretely, this model here is a ResNet 150. The ResNet 150 without adversarial training is just to the right of. So basically what adversarial training does is to take a model and move it to the left. 
which means it's above the line, but not a very good way. Right? Um, <laughs> Okay, so, but again, this is all just image classification. You could ask what about other problems? There's more in computer vision. So other research groups have reproduced similar phenomena, for instance, in MRI reconstruction. This is from a group of Unix, which studies um, deep learning for um, image recovery and medical imaging. Similar trend, fewer models, but similar trend overall, which is like linear line phenomenon. Um, this is a paper on the Barditi and others where we looked at 6D post estimation. This is a part people studying robotics, and then Becker and collaborators at Google and Waymo, they looked at this in the context of object detection. So while this task as talk is very focused on ImageNet, I think the phenomena are applicable more broadly. You can also go beyond computer vision. Um, this is a paper where we reproduce the test set for Squad, or a widely used question answering data set in NLP, in similar story here with the um, nice linear trend that all the models follow. And then also other researchers have pointed out a similar takeaway in their own robustness survey. This is a very nice paper in search of loss domain generalization. I'm just quoting from the abstract here. They say, we conduct extensive experiments using domain debt and find that when carefully implemented, empirical risk minimization shows state-of-the-art performance across all data sets. So it seems like if you just train your neural network in the standard way, you get really good robustness, or at least as good as any other algorithmic intervention, also in domain generalization. Okay, as I mentioned, there's a lot more here in terms of like why these linear trends show up, but this is a separate story. And for now, I want to focus back on the effect of data. So I told you, okay, data is the key, but if you look at this, this is actually pretty depressing because this is a 10 percentage point drop, 10 to 12, and using a thousand times more data, right? The Instagram one billion model has a billion training points. It's a thousand times more data than ImageNet, which is a million. So a thousand times more data gives you one to two percentage points improvement. If you naively extrapolate that, you would need sort of like 10 to the 10 times more data in order to close this gap. I mean, this is, this is too much. Um, but the catch is at the time, we didn't understand how handicapped these models are in terms of the we all fine-tuned models to ImageNet, and this actually reduces a lot of robustness. But this only became clear after the clip model came out. So let's talk about the clip model. Any questions before we go to part two? There's a question in the chat. Yes. Um, so what about different objectives? Are these all trained on classification and adversarial adjustment objectives? Uh, how would this behave on things like SimClear and Dino? Uh, in Perfect question. Thanks a lot for bringing it up. Um, you can put SimClear and all of the other self-supervised things on the plot exactly on the red line. Um, cool. Uh, but let's, uh, more questions? Yes. Oh, also a great question. You can put VITs on the line also exactly on the line. No, I mean, I'm serious. Like if you tell me something that's trained on ImageNet and it's not on the line, I would find it very surprising because at this point, everything that people have told me about, it's always on the red line. The same for Cifra 10 and Cifra 10.1. And I don't know what, why that is, but it's strikingly universal. Um, cool. More questions? Okay, then let's continue. With Clip. I'm sure everyone has heard of this model by now. This has been super impactful, came out in early 2021. And it's a great paper from a variety of perspectives. One thing that really blew me away was their robustness number. So this is from their blog post where they announced the Clip model. It was super exciting to see that they followed exactly our robustness framework. Sort of like they also used our test bed and effective robustness to quantify how good their models are. And what they did is the following. So they took their largest model, Clip VITL, and compared it to an ImageNet trained ResNet 101, same ImageNet accuracy. So that means in our scatter plot, we have the same x-axis value. And now we look at these out of distribution test sets, which you all know now, ImageNet V2, ImageNet R, object, and so on. And we can combine, uh, compare these accuracies. And then the gains you see are huge, like plus 6% on ImageNet V2, then plus 50 on ImageNet R, plus 40 on ObjectNet, plus 35 on ImageNet Sketch, plus 74 on ImageNet A. Right? So when you work on ImageNet, you know that a small single digit improvement is something to celebrate and write a paper about. And they came out with large double digit improvements. So this is, was and is, um, I think a big, really big step forward. And I thought, okay, well, if I want to work on robustness, I need to understand this. Um, so first of all, before we talk about this in more detail, 
um, so like where the robustness comes from, let's first get on the same page for how these clip models actually work, because they work a little bit different from standard emission models. Um, so you this is a contrastively trained model, and it's trained on paired image text data. So basically the training data comes from a web crawl. We have 400 million image text pairs. And then we set up a contrast of loss function between the image embedding, the image encoder, this is just a CNN or a green transformer, and a text encoder, also a standard transformer based model. So we get a text embedding, we get an image embedding, and then our contrast of loss function aims to map image and text embedding close together, and the other things fall away. Um, so, very elegant architecture. So, and then so you apply the standard large scale deep learning paradigm to train on a few hundred million images, crawl from the web on a few hundred GPUs for a couple of weeks. And the models by the standards of 2021 were large version models. I think maybe this is more normal now, but still 300 million parameters. Cool. And one very nice feature of this architecture is that at test time, you can do what's called zero shot inference, right? Normally, when we have a vision representation and we want to use it on ImageNet, we need to fine tune it. With Clip, you don't need to fine tune anymore. You can do the following. Someone gives you just the names of the classes that you want to classify plane, car, dog, and bird, for instance. Then you form captions out of these, like a photo of a plane, feed this into a text encoder. And now we have one text embedding per class. And then in order to classify an image, I just feed it through my image encoder. And then I do nearest neighbor classification against the text embedding. And I pick the class for which the text embedding is the closest. So, yes. This is the case now, I don't know. No, no, no. There's a lot of work that went into it. Say that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. They, they, they curated this well. I, sorry, I didn't mean to sort of like sweep this under the rug. Um, we'll come back to this later. We don't know exactly what they did for their training set because it's not public, but they did carefully curate it. Yeah. Thanks for uh, reminding us. Cool. Any more questions? No. Okay, good. Then let's look at the scatterplot version of the result because this also very nice to realize what's going on x axis image net. On the y axis, they sort of like pragmatically just averaged over seven natural distribution shifts now. The blue line is our baseline, the image net trained models. The green points are prior more data models. And then the orange line is clip and zero shot models. And so, yeah, the cool thing here is that. Clip basically closes half of the gap between where we were before and the y axis x dash line. You can open all the purple line. Um, for now, one thing that we should talk about is what's going on after five years. So, obviously, the first question that you should ask when you see this is what makes Clip so robust? The second thing, which is a bit of a catch with the result, is that fine tuning the model on ImageNet actually makes it less robust. So, if you, I think we have a, doesn't matter. Um, Okay, if you take one of those points here, at the beginning of the adapter image net arrow, this is a zero shot model, and then you fine tune it to image net, you do move to the right, you do get better on image net, but you lose accuracy on out of distribution. And this is just last layer fine tuning. If you fine tune end to end, you actually lose a lot of the robustness. And this is obviously bad, right? You would like to, if you fine tune a model, that it keeps the nice generalization properties of the zero shot model while getting better on our target task. And the question, yeah, can we get the best of both worlds, high in and out of distribution accuracy? And the answer is yes. This was my first paper together with um, collaborators at UW. It was a lot of fun. And basically there, we found an embarrassingly simple trick in order to get this best of both worlds. And the trick is just averaging between the fine-tuned model and the zero-shot model. So just set this up, x axis, image net, y axis, our distribution. The problem with fine tuning is you move right and down. Um, and the Mitchell and Gabriel are very creative experimentalists. So they thought, okay, well, what about we just take our fine tuning checkpoint and in parameter space, we average it with the zero short model. Like the whole point of a neural network is that it's nonlinear, right? So a simple linear combination from my perspective still is quite counterintuitive, but this works very, very well here. As you vary this interpolation coefficient alpha, you get this pink curve here, and then around alpha 0.5, you almost always get the best out of both worlds, good in distribution and good out of distribution accuracy. Okay. 
Um, so this is just a sketch to illustrate this. Let's see how this looks on real data. This is again ImageNet with the out of distribution shifts. And then um, the star that we are starting from is a clip EITL model. Assume it's stop working. It's stop working. Fantastic. Um, okay, and then we have two um, orange markers. We have the orange square and the orange diamond. The diamond is only last layer fine tuning. The square is end to end fine tuning. So the square does move further on the x axis, it um, adapts more to ImageNet, but it also loses more accuracy in the y axis. But the cool thing is, you can just do end to end fine tuning. And then if you do YZT or interpolation technique on top, then you get this really nice um, pink curve. Which even improves a bit on the x axis and does way better on the y axis. Um, yeah, this was this was very nice because the clip crew worked on this at OpenAI for two years and they were like, oh, there's this open problem with fine tuning. And then it turned out just interpolating works. And this also works on a variety of other data sets, the for 10, we got state of the art on wireless that way, um, and so on. And there's an obvious question here why should you stop at two models? If you can interpolate models, if you can interpolate two models, what about three, four, five, or 10? And this is what we call a model soup. So we then developed this further and got state of the art on ImageNet by just fine tuning many times and then averaging all of these models together. Yes, question. I'm, I'm just wondering why do you better, like, why do you do better on ImageNet when you have it? Because I do fine tuning shows. So as good as you can yeah, yeah, honestly, I don't have a good answer. I mean, if you, this is a great research question. I don't know. I mean, empirically, it works really well. So why it sometimes makes progress on the x-axis, I don't have a good answer for. Yes. Um, so the interpolation of the zero shot model has this like a bigger slope compared to the slope one curve. Do you think? Oh, so you mean like, why does the purple line have a different slope from the blue line? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know what's going to happen. So, like, are they going to cross? Um, Do you think that's something fundamentally prevent? Um, it's a good happen? question. I mean, no, I mean, I don't think we like, I mean, okay, nothing in principle will prevent you would, from that happening because, based on your pre trained distribution, maybe at some point you really do do better on these out of distribution data sets. It's a good question. I don't know. Oh, any more questions? Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, we took this model soup set here and pushed it further. So, one thing we did, we did with this, sorry, Seiko already mentioned, um, we built this open source repository, OpenClip. So, if you want to train your own clip models, this is currently the most widely used um, repository for doing so. Um, there's a nice community growing around now. Like, people added a uh, captioning model, Coca. We're currently adding a Confnex variant to it. Um, and yeah, if you find this useful, um, let us know. I know, yeah, we also so like push this higher in terms of accuracy just by mod making the models larger. And currently the best open source clip model is trained with open clips. We may push it to 80% zero shot accuracy. Um, cool. Okay, so this is so like the story around fine tuning. And again, there's a question, oh, is this all just an image net? What about NLP? And we also started looking into this. And this is again, more sort of a separate talk, but there's this high level phenomenon that zero shot inference and in context learning do better than fine tuning also shows up in um, NLP. So here we have x axis quad and then y axis and average over 15 other question answering data sets. The blue and orange line is fine tuning language models. And then you have zero shot inference with purple line very close to y plus x. But in the interest of time, we're going to return back to computer vision and we're also going to skip over that. And we're going to sort of like now turn to request, okay, clip is very robust. You can make it even more robust with um, enhanced fine tuning techniques. Where does all of the robustness come from? But before we do that, any more questions? Quick question in the yes. chat. Um, would you consider recursively interpolating as finding the geodesic along the manifold of models? recursively interpolating as the geodesic on the manifold of models. What do we mean by recursively interpolating? Um, okay, maybe we can talk about this later. Um, sure, absolutely. Any more questions? 
Okay, then let's talk about um, where the clip robustness comes from. Um, so up, this is basically the paper where we figure this out. The title gives it away. Data determines the distributional robustness. But before this paper, there were a couple of hypotheses. Some of them the audience already suggested, which was very nice. Um, so the first obvious one is language supervision, right? The big innovation with clip was we are now training on image text pairs. Maybe this is where all of the robustness comes from because none of the image net models had that. Um, the next hypothesis was the training distribution. Um, for CLIP, we don't know the exact distribution because the training set is private, but it's definitely not image. The next one is training set size. So CLIP was trained on 400 million images and standard supervised image is 1.2. And I'm intentionally separating distribution from size here because um, these are different things, right? One is the distribution you're sampling from and then a separate factor is how many samples do we have from the distribution. Then we talked about loss function, contrastive versus supervised. Um, test time prompting is something you can now do with flip models because, well, you can prompt them. And finally, model architecture. It's also something people have already asked about VITs versus CNNs. Cool. And as I mentioned, VITs versus CNNs, this is something we already knew. Fortunately, we didn't have to do more experiments here um, because on the blue line, we had put VIT models trained on ImageNet. They are also on the blue line. And when the OpenAI people did their research, they also released both CNN and VAT flip models, and they're all on the same line. Like the orange line, I think is three or four VAT models and five CNN models. So model architecture is out. The next thing we can rule out is training set size. Um, so this was back in the paper that I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk. The first time we found out that more data gets you above the red line, we thought, okay, we are very strong. If more data gets you above, less data will get you below. And then we tried the following experiment. Um, let's subsample image net by a factor 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. And then it turned out that we were actually not that smart. If you subsample, you move exactly along the red line. So the red line is really a property of the training distribution. If you have less data from the same distribution, you stay on that linear trend. Okay, um, training set size is out. Um, the main contenders really were language supervision and training distribution. So we'll do a deep dive into those two now. And in order to do that, we have one more data set is going to come into play, and this is YFCC 15 million. So maybe you've heard of this already, YFCC 100 million is a larger image text data set from Yahoo, Flickr, all of them Creative Commons licensed. And OpenAI released a 15 million subset of YFCC as a representative sample of their training set. They were like, hey guys, sorry, we can't make our training set public, but here's something that's pretty close. So I've seen 15 million, it's smaller, but it's pretty close. And it's part of their training set and they claim it's a representative sample. So we are going to use this in our experiments. And in order to check whether this is actually representative or not, let's do the following experiment. Imagement versus Imagement V2. The purple stars are the OpenAI club models trained on 400 million images. And then the four black stars here are our open clip trained reproductions, only trained on YFCC. And then the cool thing is that these black stars are exactly on the same purple line that the high accuracy clip one is on. So as I mentioned earlier, you can extend these linear trends um, over a wide range of accuracy, and the models are going to fall on that line. Cool. Okay. So this was all like a calibration check here, whether the YFCC data set is representative of the OpenAI training set. Good. And now what we would like to do is disentangle the training set from the presence of language supervision, right? So one way you can think about this is sort of like these four quad quadrants here. Top left is what we've been doing as a community for a long time before flip, standard image net training, so training set image net and standard supervised without language. And then clip came out, and now we have models trained on YFCC with language supervision. But two things change, the training set changes and language supervision at the same time. So you would like to fill in the other two quadrants. Basically train on ImageNet with text captions and clip, and then train on YFCC, but without the text. Okay, so how did we do this? Let's look at the top right quadrant first. And yeah, I mean, the ideal experiment here would have been, let's train on ImageNet with and without text annotations. The obvious problem is ImageNet doesn't have text annotations. It only has the one out of K class labels, okay? And so what do we do? There were a couple of things we talk, thought about. You could just make up your own captions with templates like a photo of a German Shepherd, 
But this is sort of like way more clean than the actual Flickr or OpenAI captions. You could run an image captioning model, but then you have that confounder in there, which is not great. Um, you could collect new annotations from humans. That sounded like a lot of work. Um, we knew there are actually original text annotations. So as a result of this ImageNet v2 experiment, we knew that for about half of ImageNet, there are the original images on Flickr. It's just unclear how you match them up. So we did a lot of data wrangling in order to match up half a million images in ImageNet to the corresponding Flickr URLs. And once we had that matching, we could just get the original human-generated captions from Flickr for half of the ImageNet training set. So this data set we call ImageNet captions. And here are a couple of examples. Well, it's images with captions. So there's a couple of different kinds of text associated with an image on Flickr. A title, a description, human generated text. It doesn't matter what text you use. We tried different combinations. The results are all the same. Okay, so now we can do our actual experiment. X axis image net, as always, Y axis distribution shifts. Blue line are image net trained models. Purple line uh, clip. Again, as a check here, if we train clip models on YFCC, we end up on the same pink line. Line. And now the big question was, what happens if we train club models on ImageNet captions? And these are the green hexagons here, and they're exactly on the blue side. So you get zero robustness from the text annotations on top of ImageNet. Okay, so language supervision alone does not promote robustness. Okay, any questions about this experiment? I, I, I had a question. Yeah, yeah. So let's go through the uh, great question. We'll get to this in one or two slides. Um, let's see. How are we doing with time? Are we, um, should we? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. And this includes questions at the end or not? Uh, it, would, it would include questions. Yeah. I see. Then let's go maybe like for seven more minutes, something like that. Okay. But we have time for a quick look into this experiment then, which is training on YFCC without text, sort of like the other direction. And uh, basic question was, can we get the same robustness gains as clip image text if we only use the image data? And so we invented a new training procedure for this that we call no clip because it's not clip in the sense of like no text is involved. And it goes in three steps. First, we train an image representation on only the images in YFCC. So we take YFCC, we throw away all the text, now we have only the images, and we train a SimClear model on that. Okay, so far so good, but the problem is you can't use this as a classifier. The model knows nothing about what a German Shepherd is or what a Golden Retriever is. So the next thing we do is we create a subset of YFCC um, by substring matches, substring matching the ImageNet classes against the captions in YFCC. Okay, like taking a step back, the obvious thing to do would be, well, you take the SimClear representation and you fine tune it on ImageNet and you can use it for ImageNet classification. But we know from the first half of the talk that fine tuning is a really bad idea. If you want to reason about the effective robustness of a model, you should not fine tune because that will erase effective robustness. So we wanted to adapt this without fine tuning on ImageNet. So we built this like pseudo image net data set out of YFCC, where we used string matches against the YFCC or against the text in YFCC. This is the only part where text comes in. The model doesn't see the text. The text only comes in in order to create a thousand class version of YFCC. So then we fine tune our simply representation on this subset of YFCC that we could match against the image net classes, and then we get a classifier that way. And yeah, let's put this on our scatter plot again. And, and what we get now with this procedure, no clip here, are the orange um, diamonds. And they are very close to the purple line, maybe a little bit below. Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but you definitely get a look over the, over the blue line. So most of the robustness does come from the images, not from the text. Cool. So now we can go back to our overview um, table here, and we can strike out language supervision. So loss function and test time prompting are left. And on the right hand side, we have the kind of analysis for three different self supervised learning techniques that we tried SimClear, 
some say I'm a swap. There are more. You are right. Um, we didn't try all of them, but uh, this is what we found. That they also end up on the same blue line. So they alone don't give you the robustness. And then on the left, we tried various different prompting things, and you also don't, don't get robustness from those. So basically, the only thing that's left at the end is strength distribution. And I think this leads to this question that I asked at the beginning, sort of like how can we improve things by building better pre-training data sets? And so this is what I'm really interested in at the moment research-wise. So as a first step in this direction, one thing we did was just trying to map out how much do different pre-trained data sources actually differ in their effective robustness. So what we did was collect a library of six different web data sources, YCC, we talked about that, Lion, Redcaps, this is from Reddit, um, conceptual captions, which comes from Common Crawl, with a Swiki image text, and Shutterstock. And then you can see it's kind of a rainbow pattern here, like it's all over the place. Like depending on the kind of out of distribution tests that you look at, these different web data sources do differ a lot in the robustness you get out of the models. And yeah, I mean, this is all relatively small accuracy. These are, like, these are sort of like 15 million image data sets. So the obvious question is like, what happens at the sort of like larger scale of like, higher accuracy models for real. And this is what we're currently working towards. So the first step was as a foundation, let's just build this lie on 5 billion data sets so an open data set of 5 billion image text pairs. Because, well, this is just a foundation for a lot of things. It's a foundation for CLIP. These large image text data sets also the foundation for all of the exciting work in image generation. Um, like the technique almost doesn't matter. You can use diffusion, you can use autoregressive models. The one common foundation is always you need several hundred million image text pairs and then cool things happen. And yeah, just to give you an overview of what Lion is, I mean, it's 5 billion image text pairs. I think the interesting thing is how did we build this? So this is the data creation process. So we started from Common Core because um, we needed a lot of data as candidates. So Common Core um, contains about 50 billion image text pairs. So this is image tags and HTML with the corresponding alt text. And then the main filtering we did of this, uh, on top of that was um, clip score filtering. So we used OpenAI's E32 model. And then we, for every candidate image text pair, computed image embedding, text embedding, looked at the similarity. And if the similarity was above a certain threshold, the cosine similarity, then we decided to include the data point in our data set. And this worked way better than I had expected. So there's an obvious, always this tricky thing. If you put a model into your data saturation process, will this ever get better than the model that you use for filtering? And the answer is yes, that worked better. What a question. Oh, because we started this before L14 was out. Good question. And you don't want to switch halfway through because it's kind of messy. Okay, so the good news is this does really well in the sense you can train large models on this. The bad news is that as you make the models larger, the gap to the open AI models increases. So like at the D32 scale, if you look at image and accuracy, um, 400 million, 400 million matches the club model up to 0.4 percentage points. And at the L14 scale, now we have a three percentage point disadvantage compared to the open AI club model. And on some of the out of distribution tests that like object net, this is actually becoming a pretty large gap. Like we are nine percentage points behind the open AI data set on object net. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, hey. Hi. Uh, it's a good question on the uh, filtering with uh, the two wrap questions. We wanted what fraction of the like image text pairs were rejected on how that filtered? Yeah, about 90%. 90% were rejected. Yes. Like we, we went from a 50 billion candidate pool to a 5 billion data set. And do you have a rough sense of, even just based on a box check of like what fraction of those that were rejected where? No, I and mean, these are all really good questions. So the way I think about Lion 5D is let's just get a large data set out of the door as quickly as possible because people wanted that. And what we're doing right now is then successor version to Lion, which is going to be this beautifully engineered data set that's better in all respect. So, yeah. So this is why for all of these questions, I'm like, I don't know. Um, but we will know soon. And actually, this is really exciting. So basically, um, okay, the scaling, it also scales worse. I mean, it's a great data set. Stable Diffusion was trained on it, but there's definitely more work to be done. And the cool thing is 
And the successor data set will hopefully have the paper out. So we're building a benchmark around this now, a benchmark for pre-training data set duration. And our first large-scale experiment was done a couple of weeks ago. And we are already four percentage point better than Lion. And for the first time, we are, have a model that's better than OpenAI's clip model when you hold compute and model size constant. So now we have a pre-training data set that's better than the OpenAI pre-training data set as of 2021. Cool. But yeah, this is something um, that we are wrapping up at the moment. Um, okay, let's wrap up the talk also now, and then I'm happy to talk more questions. Um, okay, so the high level of the story here was there are still very challenging distribution shifts in machine learning, and the clip model has made a lot of progress on some of them. The key driver behind this progress is the better pre training data set. It's not only scale, but also diversity. And I put diversity in quotation marks because I don't know what it is. I think this is one good question here. Can we quantify structure in these data sets in a more fine-grained way? And also, just to be clear, I have said that language supervision is not the um, cause itself, but language supervision is amazing. The only reason why they could put together such a big, diverse data set is because language supervision allows you to get around all of this MTurk image labeling that people have been doing before. So the data set is more diverse because language supervision allows you to build more diverse data sets. The language itself is not doing the thing, but you can put these more diverse image data sets together because language is pretty universal. Cool. And now the big question I think is, how do we construct training sets to deal broadly reliable models? And yeah, we'll have to, more to say about it in a couple of weeks. Um, for now, thanks a lot for listening. If you want to train clip models, as I mentioned, open clip. If you like these scatter plots now, you can go to robustness.emissionatv2.org and you can make all 20,000 scatter plots in the test. So have fun. <laughs> <laughs>